day after, 6th and 7th, we have a conference, a Diversities and Connections, Reconsidering Ethnic Boundaries in Northeast India. This is being uh, organized by the NMML with three very distinguished scholars, Dr. Minakshi Barkataki Rusheve from Guttingen, Dr. Philip Ramirez from CNRS Paris, and Professor Tanka Subba from the Sikkim University. Uh, this uh, begins at uh, 9 o'clock on Thursday. It will be in this room, and the schedule uh, will be available. It's also on our website. We have uh, on Friday a young scholar uh, with a very topical uh, subject. Her name is Dr. Noor Like. She's with the International Peace Institute in New York. Uh, she's, as will be evident, an Arabic-speaking scholar. Uh, it's on Youth in Revolt, a field report from Egypt and Tunisia. On 10th of February, Monday at 3 o'clock, we have uh, in the Hindi lecture series, Samaj or Itihas, Dr. Manindrana Thakur of JNU, Ekor Parampara Ki Khoj, Mukti Kami Dharm or Hindi Chintan Jagat. Sorry, it's very difficult to read uh, Hindi in the Roman script. And uh, next week on Thursday and Friday, there's a two-day conference with the rubric Unruly Environments, Ecologies of Agency in the Global Era, which we're doing jointly with Professor Christoph Mach of the Ludwig Maximilian University, Dr. Siddharth Krishnan of Atri Bangalore, Professor Christopher Pastore of Montana, and Samuel Temple of the University of Oklahoma. Among our publications, there are several which are available, and uh, one of the new ones by our own uh, distinguished uh, fellow, uh, Jangal Ka Sangharsh, Prakriti Shil Kanun or Raj, Kamal Nayan Chaube. This is paper 3, Samaj or Itihas, Naveen Shrinkla. Link Samaj or Itihas by Shalini Shah, which is the fourth in the series. Uh, in the History and Society series, uh, Rohit Vanchu's Imagining Hindi, The Politics of Language Before and After Partition. And a very insightful new paper uh, from uh, uh, arising out of a public lecture here in, an, in, in a series on rethinking history, Suchitra Balasubramanyam's The Myth of the Hare and Hounds, Making Sense of a Recurring City Foundation Story. In the Perspectives in Indian Development series, there are two new papers. Number 23, Equity and Quality are Two Sides of the Same Coin in India's School Education by Vimala Ramachandran. And number 24, In the Shadow of Terror, Terrorism and the Contemporary Indian Novel in English by Meenakshi Bharat. Uh, these are all available on our website, www.nehrumemorial.nic.in. No, no, he won't let them walk. Put a barrier in case people try to walk across and hope they won't vault over the barrier. Yeah, you can go there now if you want, in case you want to. Anyone wants to shift there now, you're most welcome. Uh, before I welcome Professor Bina Agawal, I just want to uh, formally thank her as well as personally thank her because I am aware of how busy she is. But uh, she not only agreed to speak, but has drawn on some of the most recent research she has done. Uh, Professor Agarwal is presently Professor of Development Economics and the Environment at the University of Manchester. Uh, she was uh, uh, Director of a very key institution in Delhi, the Institute of Economic Growth. She has also been president of the International Society for Ecological Economics. Uh, she has uh, uh, numerous publications, nine in all. I will not give you the full list, but most significantly, A Field of One's Own, which was published by Cambridge University Press in the 90s, and Gender and Green Governance, uh, which has recently been published by Oxford University Press. There's a three-volume compendium of selected papers, which is forthcoming with OUP. She holds honorary doctorates from the ISS at Hague and the University of Antwerp, and in 2008, she received the Padma Shri, but more importantly, uh, or equally importantly, she received the Leontief Prize from Tufts University for broadening the frontiers of economic thought. Uh, I think uh, it's difficult to think of a more topical lecture. Governing South Asia's forests, does women's presence make a difference? I'm sure we all have our thoughts on it, but uh, without further ado, Professor Akhav.
papers are original. They are actually given here in a Hindi lecture series. The government under the Central Hindi Directorate has a substantial uh, allocation for the popularization of Hindi. And normally there are some events during something called the Hindi Pakwada, and uh, which we continue to hold. It's, it's, it's very important for uh, institutions to have poetry competitions and essay writing competitions, but we reassessed it and we do think that we should also have other activities. So we've retained all that. And one of them is to have serious intellectual dialogue in, uh, in Hindi. So these are all papers that were presented here in Hindi and they've been uh, written in Hindi. They're not translations. They are originally written in Hindi. So perhaps okay, I can hand you. So I'm um, really delighted to be here, and uh, I must congratulate uh, uh, Mahesh Rangarajan. He's, n he's nodding his head the wrong way. We nod our head like this when we mean yes. <laughs> anyway, I, I think what Mahesh has done over, uh, since he took over is quite, quite, quite amazing. There isn't a single seminar or lecture that I wouldn't like to go come to, um, and I'm quite happy to uh, have be deluged rather than the other way as reminders. Uh, so <clears throat> we are very lucky to have him here and to organize this amazing intellectual feast which he's been doing over the past, how long Mahesh? Two years, little more than two years. Little more than two years. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let me begin with the story. I, uh, uh, you know, when I was 11 years old, um, I remember hearing the sound of an axe. We used to live in these one of these sort of sprawling bungalows in what was called Electric Lane. And I came out and I saw that there was a tree which was in our neighbor's house. Its branches overhung our garden. And there were two men who were hacking the branches of the tree. So I went there and I said, look, you can't hack this tree because in Delhi there's a law that you can't cut trees in your own garden. And it took them a while to see where the voice was coming from. And then they looked down and they said, Nay, baby, hum to aap peer chant rahe hain. So I just stood there. And I said, no, you can't do it. Um, especially if you belong, your, your, uh, does your master know it? He's, uh, he's an MP. So they knew I wasn't going to budge. They finally came down. And this was a mango tree, which still stands, although it's pretty armless, in that garden, which was shared with a shared wall. It was a public good. And in a sense, you know, my, uh, my association with trees, and that's why I'm delighted to be talking about forests and researching forests, really goes much beyond simply an academic interest or to reduce trees simply to carbon, as we've tended to do. So let me, let me begin with a simple question. Where are most of the world's forests located? Can anybody have a guess? Guess? Brazil, what else? Okay. Indonesia, Brazil. So here's where they are. 53% of the world's forests are located in five countries. Russia, North America, which is US and Canada. Yes, Brazil and China. And as you can see, what about the rest? Ten countries have no forests. Another 50, 54 countries have less than 10% land under forest. So if you take all the world's countries, then a third of the countries have either no forest or less than 10%, which is barely any forest. And if you look at this picture regionally, this is what it looks like. I mean, it sort of looks as if it's not unequally distributed if you take it as regions. But if you think of the previous slide, then in fact, there is a huge difference within each region. And then if you look at India, and you see the greenest part in this map, which is the northeast, um, is where most of the forests are. Hang on. Here, this part, this is the greenest part. And then you have forests in this region, Orissa, Madhya Pradesh, etc. This is Nepal, by the way. And then for the rest, you have large parts of the country which has left the less, no forest or less than 10% of the area under forest. Some of you will recognize that these are also the regions which, have, um, which are the uh, agricultural bowls of the country. So why is it important that you have forests? 
Of course, we've heard a great deal that they provide carbon sinks in the context of climate change. We also know that they are very important for biodiversity, although not all forests are biodiverse. Nevertheless, a large part of, you know, in, in many forests are biodiverse in varying degree. And they provide, particularly for our regions in South Asia, a, lot, a great deal of our basic needs in rural areas and livelihoods. So if you take wood fuel, which is um, firewood and charcoal, it accounts for 50% of the wood that is withdrawn globally, 90% in Africa. There are food items, various varieties of food items, berries, uh, fruits, wild vegetables, herbs, and so on. They provide livelihoods for over 10 million people. It's probably an underestimate because it was never really properly counted, um, especially for the rural poor. They provide fodder for milch cattle and draft animals. They provide green manure. They conserve the soil. They conserve water. And overall, what they do is they reduce inequalities in private property resources. So if you don't have a piece of land of your own and no tree, and you know, no, no, no land with trees, you have to go to the forests and common lands to gather some. And I think this is also a part of the hidden inequality. But forests are declining. Now, some of this decline is nature-made. Fires, droughts, natural disasters, climate change. Often, you know, you'll, you'll be surprised, fires are often caused by lightning. But I've written, at times, also people-driven, because fires are caused not just by natural causes. Fires can also be caused because people resent the fact that they don't have access to forests. So they might cause forest fires. But the more, one of the most important people-driven causes historically has been that we've converted forest land into agriculture for cultivation. And then we've, we've uh, cut down forests for large dams, for mining, for industry, for urbanization, for roads, for illegal logging during the, during the colonial period, uh, the railways, uh, which we use all the time uh, for building wagons, for building railway lines. We cut down large amounts of forests. Those who know Ram Guha's uh, early work the Unquiet Woods, we'll see how large a proportion of forests were just uh, fell down and left to rot because there was overfilling. But they're not declining everywhere. So if you look at it regionally, the yellow bits are some of the more positive stories. So regionally, forests are declining in most parts of the globe. In Europe, they are slightly increased, and in Asia, they have increased in much greater part. Within Asia, although this table doesn't show that, it's predominantly China, but also India and Vietnam. Now, if you take South Asia, and here it's, you know, if you take it from 1991 to, to the present, you'll see that firstly, if you see the, the last column here, you'll see that some parts of South Asia have actually virtually no forest. Pakistan, very little in Bangladesh, 10%. Much of it is in the Chittagong Belt, which is, uh, but not elsewhere. And then uh, you have, but in Bhutan, you have very substantial proportion of the countries in, under forest and in India. The India story is very interesting because if you, if you see the picture from 1991 to 2000 and 2011, we're actually having an increase. I, there is a distinction between forest area and forest cover. Forest area is the administrative area, which is under the forest department, controlled by the government. Forest cover is the actual cover of that forest area, which is a smaller proportion um, of that area, has, has trees. These trees can be of various levels of canopy, uh, from you know, less than 10% shrub to over 40% and more. So why is this increasing? And I want to argue that an important part of uh, the story lies in the fact that we is, is the issue of institutional governance. The shift of forest control and governance from governments to communities. And I will, I will elaborate on that. In my talk, which is the core of my talk, I will draw especially on my uh, book, uh, Gender and Green Governance. Um, the books are copies outside. This is a copy here on the table. And in which empirically I examine um, the whole issue of, uh, of uh, governance in general, and especially uh, women in governance um, empirically. But uh, conceptually, I believe the, 
uh, various aspects that are discussed would also have relevance for all of South Asia and beyond. So let me evoke, to begin my talk, a literary classic, The Lord of the Rings. Now, how many of you saw the film, The Lord of the Rings? Yeah, put your hands up. <coughs> Only that number. How many of you have read the book? Some have read the book. So those of you who have read Tolkien's book will agree that it has many remarkable layers. In a wonderful flight of poetic imagination, Tolkien, in part two of The Lord of the Rings, called The Two Towers, leads us into a primal, primeval forest in Middle-earth, which is inhabited by tree-like creatures, the great Ents. So when the hobbits, Pippin and Merry, ask the help against the dark forces, Treebeard, which is the oldest Ent, convenes an Ent moot, which is the equivalent of a forest council. He explains the purpose of the meeting, not only to those who turn up, but also those who could not come. He says, I'm st I have still got to explain a lot of things to those who live a long way off, and after that we have to decide what to do. It's no use denying we shall be here a long time yet, a couple of days very likely. So, what an impressively democratic and inclusive form of decision making. And yet, something is missing. There are no women, none in the council and none in the forest. The ant trees in the ant moot are all male. Also in this lush forest, you don't see any women who are searching for firewood or fodder or medicinal herbs or all the sorts of things that I, I mentioned, which is, its, which, which is in women's domain to collect. What Tolkien has done with a delft flick of storytelling is to say that the ant wives, the female ants, who kept order and peace and cultivated gardens have long disappeared. In other words, women and their work have been made invisible. Moreover, there is no hint that ant wives were ever invited to an ant moot. So this story perfectly captures the essence of a term that I'd coined in 2001 in a paper termed participatory exclusions, which is exclusions of significant sections from seemingly participative institutions, institutions which are formally participative but effectively not. And in this case, the exclusion of women from forest governance. Now what we have to do, we have to take a giant leap forward in end time and the sharp eye of an economic historian called Jane Humphreys in the UK to even spot women in the forests of Middle Earth. And what she describes in the 18th and 19th centuries are forests uh, which were at that point commonwealth. And she describes how women use these forests. Now this is, this is an old... Um, uh, sort of painting I found, and she says women were the principal gatherers of fuel. In Cornwall, they cut fruzz, fruzz in early summer from thickets up to 10 feet high, and in Surrey, they brought home prodigious loads of wood from the forest, bent nearly double. She also describes women gathering watercress, rabbits, pigeons, raspberries, hazel, hazelnuts, and, and so on. Um, people want to just move there. Um, <clears throat> So essentially, you will recognize in this, I could move from this picture to have a woman in Nepal or in India uh, and, and substitute that, and she'd be gathering the same things. Now what happened, of course, in the UK in the, late, in the 18th and 19th centuries was the enclosure movement, which converted this commonwealth into private wealth. And so it deprived peasant women who had independent access to items of daily use, uh, the uh, access to these forests. Now, of course, many women, and I, you know, I checked on this, I said, did they protest? And indeed, they did. But they had very little influence uh, in, uh, on the decisions. So today, we have this duality. Women's central role um, and stake in and knowledge of forests, but their near absence from the bodies that control forest use. As, and this seems to be a common feature across the globe, the Amazon, Africa, and especially South Asia. So I will trace briefly South Asian women's uh, absence, not just from forest institutions, but from traditional institutions of forest governance and other governance, and then examine the impact of their presence. <clears throat> 
Now, it was very interesting that, and Mahesh might have more to add to that in the discussion, that historians of South Asia have paid rather little attention to women in governance, except when they are focusing on their struggle for the right to vote when this, and, 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 and to stand for elections in the early 20th century. South Asian environmental history tells us even less about gender and governance. So people are described as ungendered entities which are subsumed into general categories, like these are the villagers, these are the tribals, even when the context clearly indicates that the, the gender of the subject. So for instance, there is a well-known environmental historian who talks about the 1965 Forest Act in India, and he notes hardship for villagers gathering fuel wood, thatch grass, and fodder was anticipated. But clearly in this statement, it is women as collectors of firewood and fodder who face such hardship, and not all villagers. So this is a classic example of conflating gendered subjects into general ones. So what do we do if we want to infer women's place historically in local environmental governance? What I did was try to glean through hundreds of ethnographies and colonial accounts. And these indicated that local governance was neither participative in scope, nor was it democratic in conception. Typically, village affairs, including allocating, allocating rights on the commons, were managed by hereditary he headsmen. And they did this on behalf of the village councils. So women were usually excluded from the councils. So even if there was a dispute which involved a woman, she, she, a represent, male representative uh, would represent her. And although uh, women used forest extensively, they had very little voice in governing them, not unlike Tolkien's uh, Middle Earth. Now if you move from that kind of background of exclusion to include women in public bodies in South Asia, that move can only be termed dramatic. Now the shift which took place had three major trajectories. That is from absence to limited presence. The first uh, trajectory <coughs> was um, it, for women to participate in public decision making, which took root in the early 20th century, um, was in the context of India's uh, struggle against the British, in which large numbers of women, as we know, participated. Now, lobbying by women's organizations in the emerging democratic institutions, if you remember, culminated in women getting the right to vote and to contest elections. So this is the first trajectory. The second trajectory was decentralization of government in the 1950s, you know, when, women, when the village uh, panchayats were being set up and the number of committees. And at that point, as one of the committees, somewhat more progressive, said, we must have women because women have participated in the struggle. They have a claim. But we should have more than one woman, because one woman will feel lonely. So we should have at least two women. And that became a pattern. And as you know, in 1993, as we know, we amended our constitution and reserved one-third seats for women in local government. The third um, trajectory was in the 1990s, which was the push to decentralization of forest management. And here I want to emphasize that the move towards decentralization of government and governance was not coincident with the decentralization of forest governance. So they, they didn't automatically move from one to the other. But they were, I, I, I believe, a necessary condition for women to participate. And what happened uh, then was, of course, the devolution of control of forest management in communities um, and uh, moving away from um, government. Uh, how did this happen? I mean, there's a long history. There's no way I can cover it today. But just very brief markers. In the 1970s, uh, as you may remember, satellite images showed that India's forests were disappearing at a very rapid rate. Uh, and uh, we focused on the building of very large dams, of roads, railways, cities, and so on, all of which led to this. Now, to stem this decline, what governments did, not just in South Asia, but in many parts of the world, they launched tree planting schemes under the banner of social forestry. And uh, as I argue in my 1986 book, Cold Hearts and Barren Slopes, social forestry was promoted in a top-down manner. And there were many commercial trees which were planted. In our part of the world, it was mainly eucalyptus. Uh, and there was very little discussion with villagers on what to plant and how to share what is the benefits. 
So very few of the trees planted on community land survived. There was a, there was a World Bank midterm report which said 2% of trees in Uttar Pradesh, 2% of those planted survived. The, the program neither revived forests nor did it fulfill people's needs. So social forestry, as one might argue, was neither social nor forestry. Now this, this state failure was being seen all over the world. It was a global debate and uh, some of us economists, they term it as the property rights debate. The question was, what is the best institutional form under which you might manage your forests, which would serve the social purpose as well? And so what you had was a dichotomy because what you had was um, on the one hand emerging stories of successful protection by communities. There were self-initiated groups, there were forest movements which provided an alternative. And by the late 19, uh, 1980s, there was a growing consensus globally in favor of communities managing forests. So 50 countries at that point in time launched co-management programs. India was among the first, um, and we, we launched our joint forest management program in, in June of 1990, uh, in which villagers and government were supposed to share the responsibility and the benefits of regenerating local forests. Nepal followed suit in 1993 with its own version of community forestry. So by the early 2000s, India had an estimated 84,000 such groups involving 8.4 million rural, fa rural families and protecting 22% of India's recorded forest area, 22.4. Nepal had nearly 10,000 groups. Uh, remember, Nepal is a much smaller country. It's a smaller in geographic area than Gujarat. And it covered 1 million households and 11% of forest land. So I'll call these groups Community Forestry Institutions, or CFIs, for short. Now, women were to be included in CFIs, but in limited degree. So most Indian states went back to that at least two women because one woman is lonely kind of idea and they said, okay, we must have at least two women, as they did in the Panjats. And some, of course, later scaled it up to say, okay, we should have one third. But this was treated as a maximum, not the minimum, as it was meant to be. And in practice, of course, as with most laws and orders, um, the CFIs did not follow what was prescribed even as a minimum. So uh, women, uh, where women were included, there were other kinds of problems that they faced. And this is something I want to talk about a bit, because even if you're included formally in a governance structure um, or, a, or a committee, do you really participate? Now, we use the term participation very casually. We've been using it at least since the 1960s, if not earlier. And what you end up, we, if you see a lot of empirical studies, they'll say, oh, well, how many women are members of this committee? And if X percent are members, well, we've got participation. But of course we know that's not true. Partic that's only nominal participation. And we have to move from nominal participation to what I call empowered participation, which is from simply being a member of a group to being able to influence the decisions. In between, you can have things like, oh, well, we consulted the women. Oh, well, um, we, we, we brought them in and we informed them about what was happening. Or we said, well, we've asked them to make nurseries. Isn't that participation? Um, and, and, and so on. Or we have what the World Bank typically does, which is it asks your opinions and then takes no account of them. So, so here we are. And so we, this was, a, why was this the case? There are a whole range of factors, which I won't um, uh, go into in great de detail. But typically you, what happened was that when you say you should have most of the JFM committees, they said we should have one person per household, which meant, of course, the male head of household. But even when they said uh, we should have more, uh, they were not effective. Now, this is because of traditional social norms. Women don't necessarily come out if they're one or two women. They don't speak out if it's largely a male gathering uh, and uh, so on and so forth. So here's an example of a village meeting in Gujarat, which is one of my field sites. Can you, tra can you, can you spot the women? How many are there? Can you see it? No? You can't spot them partly because the light is bad, but partly it's because they're so invisible. So here they are, and there are, of course I've given the answer away, the two women. And this is what they say, men don't stop us from speaking, but they do all the talking. <laughs> now, um, 
basically, uh, women uh, in institutions of forest governance face two opposing forces. One seeks to correct what is a historic disadvantage by prescribing women's formal inclusion, and the other perpetuates that disadvantage through social norms that restrict uh, women's effective participation. But there are also exceptions. We do have examples of mixed gender groups with 30 to 40 percent women or even all women. And there can be a range of uh, non-systematic factors which could lead to this uh, effect. Some are historical, some are demographic, some are ecological, some are because local leaders promote it. I, I won't go into the details. But having more women in the EC makes an important difference to effective participation, to that previous um, slide. It does make a difference to effective participation. What I did was I looked at whether having more than a minimum percentage of women makes a difference to women attending meetings, to speaking up at them, and holding office, holding office being, being president, vice president, and so on and so forth. And I found, although I started as a skeptic, and I said, what is this one-third we keep talking about? What's this magic figure? Why not 28%? Why not 37%? Um, and so on. When I actually measured it, and very few studies have actually tried to measure critical mass, I found that it did lie between 25 to 33%. So those who've been lobbying for this can have extra um, support for that. Uh, but uh, you do find that there is a critical mass effect. I think we need to measure it more, and especially if these women are landless. I'll come back to this question because it seems counterintuitive. A natural question is, therefore, would women's greater participation in, in decision-making in these CFIs make a difference to institutional outcomes? And this brings me to the third part of my talk, which is the impact of presence. Now, typically what you find is that economists and political scientists who've been studying environmental collective action and green governance pay rather little attention to the question of gender. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about absence or you're talking about presence. A gender perspective, interestingly, is even missing in uh, Nobel laureate Eleanor Ostrom's wide-ranging uh, writings on governing the commons. At the same time, gender and green governance in other disciplines have focused mainly on women's near absence from forestry institutions. So both bodies of work, in my view, neglected the question, what impact would women's presence have in these institutions? Would their inclusion, which is of course undeniably important for equity, also affect decisions on forest use? Would it lead to better forests? Would women's class matter? How many women would make an impact, etc.? Answers to these questions could prove foundational in effective environmental governance and policy. Now, these questions are the central concerns in my book, Gender and Green Governance. Now, I, I based uh, this on, uh, I, I based this book on primary, uh, a primary survey and many years of field travel across India. And, and I tested what impact the gender composition of the, of, uh, uh, the group um, has uh, on women's participation in rulemaking, in violations, in forest conditions, and on firewood and fodder shortages. This is a measure of equity because it's mainly women who gather firewood and fodder. And uh, today what I'll do is I'll detail my findings on one aspect, which is namely, which is that of forest conservation. But first of all, I'm sure you want to ask, at least some of you would want to ask, why does it matter? Why would we expect women's presence to make a difference? So I won't take this for granted. I will talk about it. Rural women's dependence on forests is different, is greater, and it's more every day than men's. And this distinctions, uh, distinction comes from the uh, gender division of labor, which affects the nature of women's dependence on the commons. By nature, I mean, what is it that they actually gather? Predominantly, you'll find that the responsibility of gathering firewood and fodder in particular and various non-timber forest products rests mainly on women and girls and children. And the division of labor is such, and men tend to be much more responsible for timber. The, the second aspect is that there's a gender division of economic resources. So that just as if you're a landless household, you have very few private property resources, you depend on the commons, for subsistence. So within the household also, 
the, for the items that women collect, because they have so, such little access to private property resources, whether it's a la lack of access to land or to employment and so on, they are much more dependent on the commons. So you can actually go and buy timber from the forest, but it's much, much more difficult given the needs that for women to go and simply purchase, apart from the absence of adequate markets. And the third is that women's need is every day, whereas men's is sporadic. Now all this creates, uh, creates uh, makes a difference uh, to their, uh, and here are of course some pictures, we are all familiar with these pictures taken from different parts of the world though. Uh, and um, here is a picture of a Nepali woman you, if, you are, if you're lighting the stove every day and you're old and you have no daughter-in-law to help you, you're going to be collecting your own firewood. Um, carrying fodder, collecting mushrooms, and so on and so forth. So all these factors make a difference to the impact of the dependence then has an impact on forest conservation. Firstly, because of this inequality, you have unequal adverse effect on women's time, on their income, on their nutrition and health, if forests and local commons decline or they degrade or they are enclosed. I mean, some of these you, you would intuitively understand that if you, if you enclose a forest nearby, you don't allow them to go and it'll take longer if you want to collect for, if you, uh, in terms of time. But then if you're collecting multiple items, it'll affect your nutrition. Uh, and, and health is affected both by aspects of nutrition and it is also affected because you walk longer and so on and so forth. Then the differences in knowledge systems. So if knowledge here is not something you learn in classrooms, of course, it's something that you gain in an everyday sense. And therefore, uh, if men, women collect different items from what men collect, they have different knowledge systems. It is not my argument, unlike the ecofeminist argument, that only women are the repositories of all knowledge about, the, about forests and the environment. But it is certainly my argument that there is differentiated knowledge. Then there's differences in the gestation period. And this is very interesting. Because, you know, we don't take this into account. Firewood and fodder is, 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 is seasonal. You know, the, if you have a tree, it drops its branches. You can collect it. There is, there's, a, there's a gestation period is, is lower. But timber has a longer gestation period. So women, uh, if they need it every day, need to actually have access every day. Whereas if the gestation period for timber is longer, you don't need to have access every day. Now, I'm going to tie this up because this will all affect how you're going to participate in conservation. There are also then differences in the values you place in different ecosystems. You know, economists everywhere are trying to give a value to different parts of the eco ecosystem, saying, well, how much do you va value berries, or how much do you val value this and that? But what they don't take into account is the fact that men and women may have di quite different values. Um, and, you know, the sort of evaluation, the contingency evaluations that you do could affect it. Now, what all this does is, these differences mean that you have differences in the interests, the preferences, and the stakes in conservation. And so we need to question standard assumptions which exist in economics and political science and possibly in others, other disciplines on, about the commonality of gender interests and preferences. Not only forest conservation, but particularly, as I'm arguing today, in forest conservation. So, so far so good. But then I want to argue also that we have to be careful of what kind of gendered analysis we do. And I want to argue against the linear narratives, what I call linear narratives, which, is, which has also flooded the literature, which is the argument that let's bring women in and all good things will follow. Now, yes, they will follow in an equity, equity sense, but they will not necessarily follow in a conservation sense. Why is that the case? Don't we need to verify whether bringing women in will necessarily improve conservation? And the reason is that uh, on the one hand, as I said, if women depend more on the local resources and forests, they are compelled to extract more. So um, I remember asking a, a woman when I was doing some field work in Uttarakhand, and I said, you know, uh, you just brought home this green branch and won't that destroy the tree? They said, of course, it, it, it hurts me to cut a green branch. But what do I do if my children go hungry? So this is the essence of it. The essence of it is that women face conflicting interests between immediate subsistence and long-term conservation. Hence, the impact of their presence could go either way. It could lead to better conservation. It could lead to less better conservation. <clears throat> 
and we need to control for other factors which can also affect outcomes in order to attribute to gender what, it is, what is its due. So you can't just do a cross tabulation and show everything because you have to control for so many factors. So let me illustrate this with my, with my analysis. Now, my, the data I collected uh, relates to um, 135 CFIs, of which 65 were drawn from uh, three districts in Gujarat, and uh, 70 were drawn from uh, three districts of Nepal in the Middle Hills. Um, and as I had noted, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the CFI's governance structure is a fairly simple governance structure um, in the, in, under the JFM. What you have is a general body which involves all members of the village community, technically all households or maybe in Gujarat, for instance, all adults could join. Uh, and then there's an executive committee which can consist of 11 to 15 members, typically 11 members. The executive committee is the one which has the main oversight into the nature of rules made, into deciding how the forest is closed, how it should be protected, how violations should be dealt with, what should be extracted, for how many days, um, and, 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 and so on. So it is, it is key what the composition of the executive committee is, as we know from other institutions like universities and others. So what did I do? What I wanted to therefore see is whether the gender composition of the executive committee makes a difference to outcomes, conservation outcomes. And uh, the way I chose them, I did a, in, Guj in the case of Gujarat, I uh, had a stratified random sample where I'd had two ex mutually exclusive categories. Those CFIs who had two women and less, which was a sort of mandated, and those which had more than two women. In the case of Nepal, I had a third category, which is all women groups. So that you had two women and less, more than two women, but not all women, and all women. Gujarat had very few all women groups. Now, fieldwork, of course, was quite difficult. If you imagine, in the early 2000s, Nepal had a Maoist insurgency. They were not in the parliament. They were actually out in the, in, in the forests and, and, and so on. Uh, and nevertheless, we interviewed forest protection committees. We interviewed groups of men and women villagers, key individuals, forest guards, foresters, and used uh, semi-structured nine types of questionnaires. We recorded environmental histories. We, uh, we went to the forest. We assessed them. We looked at the records of meetings. We made maps. We obtained satellite data. And yeah, I'll come back to this. Um, now, what we must remember in this discussion is that Gujarat's forests at that time were very, very degraded when protection began in the 1990s. Uh, and JFM, JFM was only allowed to uh, have the transfer of very degraded forests. I remember there was a study which said if you take a broom and sweep the hillside, uh, in hill, hills, uh, hillocks of Gujarat, you won't even find uh, dry leaves. It was that bad, and many rootstocks had vanished, but not all. In Nepal, they transferred richer forests and more biodiverse. What is interesting in Nepal, however, is that they transferred to all women groups forests which were half the size, which were twice as degraded, which were much younger than the forest that they, that they transferred to groups which had men in them. And here you can see that. You have all women's groups, the mean hectare, 20, 20, 21 hectares, this is 42 hectares. You have a very degraded is really almost twice as much, and so on and so forth. So what they received, I mean, there was a very systematic um, bias uh, in relation to what uh, the women's, women got. This is, uh, this is important to see. Why is this the case? Now, local forest officials justified it, and they said, well, you know, women's abilities have really not been tested. And they said, how can you protect the forest? You have no experience. You, have, you don't know the rules. Nobody will accept your decisions. So they were given smaller, smaller forests. But I will, as you will see, the actual performance of all women's groups belies this skepticism. Now, what does protection mean? Some of you would be experts in this audience, would already know, and others not. But basically what it means is it restricts free entry of people and animals, forest closure, and it regulates the forest use. Now, regulations can range from a complete ban on entry, that you can't enter at all, to limited entry. So, for instance, if there's a monsoon, you'll say, well, we'll open the forest for three days, uh, and then you can collect the fodder. Or we'll open it just before Diwali, and you, maybe you can collect firewood. Or maybe we'll do it for twice, twice a year. 
So you, and, it, and this varies according to which product you're talking about. So you actually have, have a matrix of different kinds of forest products and different sorts of rules for each product. And, uh, and, and that's, you know, that is really fascinating because what you get is such a diversity of rules. Um, now, protection, what would you do if you wanted to protect? What would you do? Anybody? Suppose you, you, were, given this, you were given this park outside, this um, Nehru, you know, this uh, library, and you said we're going to protect six of you. What would you do? Anybody? Buy a gun. Oh, God, are they such rich forests? No, no, no. <laughs> so he'll, you'll buy a guard with a stick in hand. Anybody else? Anything else? You put hedges around. What else? Bring women in. Bring women in, but in what way? <laughs> Suppose you didn't have the money for a guard. Suppose you didn't have, a, have money for a fence. What would you do? What do you do in your house? It's very interesting because what the villagers did, since they didn't have money in for a start, is they would say, we'll have uh, uh, each household will be responsible, six people will be responsible for patrolling it for one week, and then the next household, and so on. In fact, in Uttarakhand, you have this Lat Panchayat. Lati leke, ek hafte tak protect karenge, and then we pass on the Lati to the next household. There are incentives which are non monetary which you can also use to protect your neighborhood. So what you find is a range of methods. They start off with a forest protection group, and then you might employ a guard, or you might have both, or you might say there's a wedding. To, this time there's going to be a lot of stealing, so let's bring in a guard, but only for one season, not for the whole period. How shall we pay the guard? We pay the guard cash. But you know how people are. They won't pay their cash. They won't even pay their membership fees for anything. So you say, okay, let's give them a fistful of rice or wheat or whatever. So you have this range of ways by which uh, people are protecting, and this changes over time. Because initially the enthusiasm for patrolling is very strong, and then it weakens and say, let's just get a card, and so on. So you have all of this. Now, what happens when you protect? We hope that it will improve forest canopy, it will improve biodiversity. What we are interested in, however, is to see whether including more women will make a difference to all of this. So what I did was factors. I'll just go through this quickly. As a, you know, there can be a variety of factors. There's gender of the committee. There's the age of the committee. You could expect that to matter. Older women have more authority. The people listen to them more, etc. They have more time on their hands, perhaps. Caste and literacy could make a difference. Then the protection method could make a difference. What support you get from the tech forest department. Suppose a, a tree is just beginning to grow from the rootstock. You have to clean it. You have to prune it so that only a few stems go up. All of that requires technical, some sort of technical knowledge. For people have it, but also you can help. Size of the forest, and so on and so forth. They can, if we went around this room, we'll, we'll come up with a range of factors which have nothing to do with gender, which might affect forest outcomes. So we have to control for all of this in order for me to persuade you that it's gender which is mattering and not something else. Okay. So um, how do you assess forest, forest condition? Let me ask you, how will you assess forest condition? Mahesh? <laughs> I'm the chair. The you can't say. How would you assess this is a bad forest or a good forest? Just as an example. Hmm? More trees? Okay. What else? Type, type, of vegetation. type of vegetation. Very good. All of those are correct. So you want more trees, you want density of trees, you can have types of trees. Of course, remember that if you have a semi arid forest, uh, a semi deciduous forest, you can have a lot of trees standing, but they won't necessarily have a lot of canopy cover. So, anyway, we thought that it's not possible to come up with one answer you have to have multiple answers and be able to satisfy everybody. So you can have a research team's view. What we did was we went to all the forests, especially in Gujarat, every single forest, and had this uh, little index to assess in the range of one to five, which is the, you know, what, where would we rank this forest. Villagers would have a view, 
of uh, good or not forest or it's changing. Forest department can have a view. And then you have the satellite sources. These days, and what we got was we used all these methods to look at canopy cover and regeneration. And uh, for Gujarat, we were able to get for one year at least uh, uh, the satellite view of those villages calibrated to the village level. Okay. Um, and we got these various indices, uh, four for Gujarat, uh, two for Nepal. So what did we find? Um, I'm doing much better than I thought I was. Okay. What we found was, here's one example. This is just one village. It's Malikpur in Gujarat. And this, uh, this, was the, this is a picture taken by the local NGO there. This was the state of Malikpur prior to protection. This is five years later. Now, admittedly, this is in somewhat different seasons, but nevertheless, this, this is the area that you're seeing here. What happens is if the rootstock is intact, and you, uh, you don't allow collection and animals and so on and so forth. Teak is a fairly hardy tree. So within five years, you can get a standing uh, sort of, you, you have this kind of canopy. In the in-between period, in those five years, if you have a good monsoon, you can actually collect fodder. Because you need the sun, you can get, you get, get fodder. And so uh, in one village, you can have this change. How does it look? And, and you, see, you actually find this, that irrespective of gender, in all the committees we studied, in all the groups, there was improvement in forest condition. Now, here are some macro figures. In this period, 1991, when GFM was started, in 2001, around the time of my study, or just before, area under forest the percent area under forest cover actually increased in India, all India, where it was declining rapidly in the 80s. This is from the Forest Survey of India, three different uh, years of Forest Survey of India. Area, and Gujarat actually does hugely better. It not only improves its area under forest cover, but actually does better uh, than all the All India average. From 1.9% um, of all forest area in India to 22 And then if you take the three districts where I did my research, you can again see that there is an improvement. There is no case of not improving. There is a story which we'll take up in the questions that from 2011, one to 2011, what are the figures? I'll leave you guessing. We'll come back. Okay. So this is the general picture. But we still haven't answered the question. Well, what we want to know is, is this improvement better if there are more women in the executive committees? And this is what you find. What you find is <clears throat> that indeed this is the case. Women's presence has a significant positive effect on forest condition after controlling for all the other factors that I have listed. This is so in CFIs with more than two EC women compared to two women or less in Gujarat by most indicators. And all women groups compared to other groups which have men in them in the case of Nepal. In Nepal, the performance of all women groups is especially notable because what we find is a 51%, 51% greater probability of improving forest canopy despite starting with half the size, poorer, younger forests. They outperform the groups with men in the case of all the indicators of forest regeneration. Okay, this is uh, for those who are economists who want other results. This, this is where the, this is a logit analysis. The 51% comes from here. Age of EC members also matters. It, ma it, it helps if you're literate. Um, the Brahmin thing in the Nepal is interesting because they don't, uh, they make stricter rules and, and so on. And if you have a better forest at the time of handover, it makes a difference. So women's performance is even better. Okay, five more minutes. Um, but this very interesting example, we then looked at one particular district, Panchmahal district, to see what the results are for, for Panchmahal. The reason being that Panchmahal's executive committees have a larger proportion of landless women, not just any women on the committees. And they make less strict rules, they allow for greater extraction. What I wanted to see was, does extracting more and having more landless women have a negative effect? 
That is, you extract more, it's more equitable, but it is not so good for conservation. In fact, these results show that it's dramatically the opposite. That in all the indicators, um, this, uh, the, in, in all the cases, you find that in punch mail also, conservation is better, uh, despite uh, the fact of greater extraction. And this is, uh, now the relationship with extraction is a complex one, and this relationship is complex uh, because uh, of two reasons. One is that if you take away dry incendiary matter, there's li less likelihood of forest fire. So it's a good thing to extract something. And the second is you'll have less resentment, so people won't cause forest fires, as they've been doing since colonial times to, uh, to protest against closures. So why is it that more women, um, more EC women perform better? Um, one is the protection is better, and these are some qualitative results. When you bring them into the executive committee, they say, we, we see the forest, we feel the forest is ours, when I was only a CFI member, I used to steal grass, but after becoming an EC member, I stopped stealing. They also have more information about the rules, uh, and they persuade other women to cut uh, fewer branches and so on. So they again admit of this, that we are able to persuade other women in the next village, for instance, to stop cutting. And here's a, here's a petrol group that I met in Iran. And they set up informal patrols if you talk to the women, they'll say that we are actually much better at patrolling because we find illegal cutting where the men have not spotted them. Okay. Um, so what is the... Um, there, there are other factors, you know, there are other, other aspects which matter. Uh, you have better use of not just better protection, better use of women's knowledge of plants and species. You have greater solidarity. You have less conflict, you know, uh, you, you have better mechanisms of conflict resolution if you have more women. This is also shown by the huge amount of experimental games literature which has emerged in, uh, within economics and political science. So policy pointers, and I'll take a couple of minutes here. So... Women's greater presence in forest governance can significantly improve conservation and regeneration. It can also be enhanced if you have a larger proportion of landless and poor women in the EC. So being poor and landless does not place you at the bottom of the pyramid because poor women are less restricted in social norms and they have more stake in forests. And this goes counter to a lot of the literature in feminist philosophy, Western feminist philosophy, which argues that there has to be greater equality before the poor can speak up. But in fact, if there are enough numbers, and we know that from experience of other groups, that that's not necessarily the case. So how do we increase women's numbers? And here's a suggestion that what we need to do is have a, what I call a web of strategic alliances with other gender progressive groups. And this is a stylized version of that, that you have, for instance, community forestry groups. Say if you have rather few women here, but there are a lot of self-help groups in many of the villages. Whereas, so the self-help groups can form alliances here because they have similar interests. Some of them, they are members, but not proactively made members. And then you have federations. Now, we are familiar with the federated structure from self-help groups, but Nepal has an, has an all-country federation of forest user groups. In its, in its uh, constitution, it's the only country in the world which has that, and in its constitution, 50% of the office bearers have to be women. So when we think of scaling up, you know, a lot of policymakers like to talk about scaling up. They just mean instead of five, you have to have 5,000. But that's not the point. You can scale up through these nested structures. You can interact locally in smaller groups where you feel more comfortable and through federations you can scale up. <coughs> okay, but in the long term, is this the answer? Is the answer that we continue to draw so much from our forests? I believe not because we have to find alternatives. But who will find these alternatives? Will the voices of the people who need the forests and draw daily actually reach the policy makers who make national level policy? If you need more firewood, who's listening? If you need more firewood and you tell them that there's indoor air pollution, which is killing off where the mor mor mortality rate of women is 50% higher than that of men, where 200 to 300 infants die every year because of acute respiratory infections from smoky stoves, who's listening? For this, we need much more than more firewood. We need a clean fuel. 
And so, although we talk a great deal about improved stoves, we need to really talk about uh, improved um, fuel. Now, there's, a, there's been, um, I just want to mention uh, that, uh, you know, it's very interesting that India and China started uh, their uh, improved, flow, improved stove program at the same time. Uh, they, from 80 to 92, China installed 129 million improved stoves, covering 50% of its house, rural households. India started in 1983. From 1983 to 1992, it only installed 12.5 million improved stores, one tenth. And in 1992, it covered only 8% of households which were actually using now the stoves. stoves yeah, both. So if you have an improved stove, what is an improved stove? It has two features. Basically, it's a very simple design. So you basically, you have a chimney which takes away the smoke, and you have a flu door which regulates the supply of air into the stove. So that's more efficient. And I'm going to finish with this last slide. So here's, um, so you might ask, okay, there's green governance. I'm anticipating some of the questions, uh, uh, Mahesh, and so, uh, but we can elaborate on this. I do want to say that although we've talked about green governance, we didn't start off with green governance. We talked about general governance. So are there questions beyond green governance which are applicable to other institutional forms? I believe there are. The question of critical mass, does it matter in parliament, in the issues that raise, in women's ability to speak up during question hour or elsewhere? Um, we need to test whether this 25 to 33% that I have found actually holds in other institutions like panchayats and legislatures. We need to investigate if including socially disadvantaged women does make a big difference. It's just not been tested. And we have to examine whether women in panchayats and legislatures compared to men are better linked with communities and are more likely to monitor the ground impact of policy. So you can make a policy, but you actually follow up and see, well, is it making a difference? So let me then, um, let me then conclude by something which one can't get away from, which is that no discussion on environment can be complete. Uh, we cannot talk about sustainable development.